I am your host, True Crime Tales, and today we delve into the chilling case of the Smiley Face murders. The Smiley Face Killers, an elusive group of highly organized and calculating serial murderers, have managed to evade detection for decades. Their identities and appearances remain shrouded in mystery. All we know is that they have ruthlessly claimed the lives of possibly hundreds of victims, ingeniously disguising their heinous acts as accidental deaths. The proficiency with which they dispose of the bodies has led some to question the very existence of these killers. The only tangible evidence we have are the calling cards left near the crime scenes, linking these seemingly unrelated deaths into a prolonged spree of malevolence. As you may have guessed, these sinister calling cards bear a chilling smiley face emblem. Indeed, it sends shivers down one's spine. Today we uncover the narrative of a detective who claims to have first uncovered this web of killers. His tireless pursuit spans decades as he endeavors to bring them out of the shadows once and for all. Brace yourselves, for the story of the smiley face murders is far more sinister than its name suggests. Let us delve into the tragic tale surrounding the death of Patrick McNeil, which occurred on February 16, 1997. Patrick, a student at Fordham University, frequented a dive bar in Manhattan called Dapper Dog. Patrick's favorite haunt was packed that Sunday night, mostly filled with fellow university students, aware that they could indulge in excessive drinking without being cut off or asked for identification. Ah, the bliss of anonymity. Patrick was well-liked among his peers, possessing both good looks and intelligence. With aspirations of joining the FBI, he stood as a promising individual. Additionally, his athletic build suggested a resilience to alcohol's effects. However, on that fateful night, the cheap booze seemed to overpower him. After consuming only a few drinks, he stumbled about like a freshman discovering their alcohol tolerance. It appeared as though Patrick had been drugged as he abruptly decided to call it a night shortly past midnight. Visiting the restroom to relieve himself of the effects, he bid farewell to his friends in a slurred manner and prepared to walk home with a female acquaintance. Impatiently waiting for his companion to join him, Patrick eventually grew tired of waiting and ventured out alone into the frigid night. Such determination is a hallmark of the severely inebriated, wouldn't you say? As he clumsily traversed the pavement, witnesses on the street observed him with concern, witnessing his occasional tumbles followed by a slow rise, dusting himself off and forging ahead. While such sights may not be uncommon near a university, a few attentive onlookers noticed something peculiar, a van trailing Patrick, matching his pace and halting whenever he fell. Astonishingly, when he turned onto 90th Street, the same vehicle followed suit, disappearing into the abyss. Unfortunately, that was the last sighting of Patrick McNeil for quite some time. Over a month later, the lifeless body of the 21-year-old was discovered floating face up in the East River by pedestrians on a Brooklyn pier, approximately 12 miles away from where he was last seen. His body was in an advanced state of decomposition, with only his jeans and socks remaining as remnants of his attire. Until that point, law enforcement authorities held steadfast in their belief that Patrick would reappear on his own accord. The family's persistent demand for a thorough investigation was regarded as an annoyance, prompting authorities to delve into Patrick's personal life, hoping to find reasons why he might deliberately evade their search efforts. He remained missing for a staggering period of 20 days, or rather over a month to be precise. As a former university student myself, I can't help but express my disbelief. If I had gone missing for an extended period, neither at home nor at the university, I would have fervently implored my parents and friends to initiate a search. Alas, one detective, without much evidence to support his claims, told the media that the popular Patrick had impregnated multiple women and was evading the ensuing stress. Did the detective simply fabricate this theory without conducting a proper investigation? It seems that way, which is rather peculiar. Similarly, the Dapper Dog's manager insinuated that Patrick might have been engaging in heroin use on the West Side. Goodness gracious, all of these character assassinations appeared dreadfully distasteful, especially now that the poor young man's family was being informed that their son had tragically fallen into the river and drowned that night. If indeed he had been evading his responsibilities, Patrick had taken an incredibly drastic course of action. Despite his family's tireless efforts, including distributing 10,000 flyers with the help of an army of volunteers, their search proved futile. Now, there remained one burning question. Did Patrick fall into the river accidentally, or was he possibly pushed? 
The task of answering this question fell upon Kevin Gannon, a seasoned NYPD homicide detective. Considering Patrick's unsteady gait, which had been witnessed by numerous bar patrons and pedestrians, it appeared plausible that his fall into the water was accidental. However, Gannon, along with the coroner, noticed certain inconsistencies. The pooling of blood in the body indicated that Patrick had likely died face down, contrary to how he was found, floating face up. Additionally, the relatively limited extent of skin slippage suggested that he had not been submerged in the water for the entire two months. Frankly, it is highly unusual for someone, even a 21-year-old, to go missing for two months. If you're not familiar with the intricacies of human decomposition, slippage refers to the skin bloating and ultimately detaching from the body after death. It's best not to dwell on such gruesome details, so let's move on. If Patrick hadn't been in the water all that time, then where was he? The post-mortem examination revealed what appeared to be ligature marks around his wrists and neck. Gannon theorized that the young man had been abducted, held captive on that February night, and subsequently killed indoors before being disposed of in the river post-mortem. Suddenly, the presence of that van trailing the victim down the road gained significant importance. It makes one wonder why nobody found it suspicious when someone goes missing for over a month, and reports surface about a van following him on his way home. Once again, I can't help but question the actions of the police. Gannon made a startling discovery. One witness had managed to jot down a partial license plate for the van after observing the driver's peculiar behavior. Consequently, the detective sought authorization to run a search and determine the owner's identity. Astonishingly, his request was denied on grounds of cost. How expensive could it be? Merely a matter of minutes to conduct the search on a computer. The department remained unconvinced that the death was suspicious enough to warrant this relatively inexpensive administrative task. Regrettably, that marked the conclusion of the matter on April 16, 1997. The medical examiner, in what appeared to be an astonishing display of incompetence, officially classified Patrick's death as an accident, effectively closing the case. This level of ineptitude raises suspicions, although it's unlikely that someone within the police department is deliberately covering up the truth. Nonetheless, for Gannon, the case would forever remain unresolved. Along the way, he had formed a bond with Patrick's parents, which seemed to be an unintended mistake. The grieving mother pleaded with him, saying, Please, just prove that Patrick wasn't some troubled kid who fell into the river. Gannon, with genuine sincerity, made a promise. I give you my word that when I retire, I will prove that your son was not that individual. He was abducted and murdered. Retiring from the force, Gannon turned the McNeil case into his personal crusade. His goal was to reopen the investigation, ensuring that the circumstances surrounding Patrick's disappearance could be thoroughly examined as a kidnapping and murder. No doubts about it. One crucial aspect of his process involved delving into databases containing information on similar cases from across the northeastern United States. He sought to compare physical evidence and official verdicts, hoping to find a precedent that would warrant a fresh look at the McNeil case. What he discovered was even more chilling. An alarming number of suspicious drownings in the region, all dismissed as accidents. The echoes of conspiracy began to resonate. Over the subsequent years, Gannon meticulously documented additional deaths that bore striking similarities to the cluster of suspicious drownings that had accumulated on his desk. The list included names such as Brian Wellesian, Todd Gieb, and Lucas Hallman, all young men who vanished after socializing at parties and were later discovered submerged in bodies of water. These cases shared an uncanny pattern. College students, athletic, well-liked, and academically accomplished. Each victim had gone missing following a night of drinking with friends, only to be found dead in a body of water. Their deaths were attributed to accidents or deemed unexpected. These cases, a mere glimpse of the dozens of potential leads, followed a disturbing pattern. The victims fit a specific profile, which encompassed young men studying at universities in the towns where their bodies were found. They possessed athleticism, popularity, and academic success. Tragically, their lives were cut short, their deaths either dismissed as accidental or unanticipated. It is disheartening to consider that being exceptionally cool or successful could potentially make one a target, simply due to the envy and resentment harbored by someone less fortunate. It serves as a reminder to be cautious, even in the midst of achievement and popularity. Take, for instance, the case of 21-year-old Chris Jenkins, whose body was discovered in the Mississippi River four months after he went missing. 
Found floating on his back with crossed arms over his chest, his case joined a long list of similar incidents that prompted Gannon and Duarte to consider the possibility of a connected series of crimes. As they examined the evidence photos and reports from these tragic scenes, they stumbled upon a recurring calling card left by the perpetrator or perpetrators. A simple smiley face scrawled with spray paint near the body's entry points into the water. Cross-referencing their findings with graffiti reports, they found the unnerving symbol appearing repeatedly, sometimes with variations in shape and color, but always with a smug little grin. Convinced that these cases were the work of a highly skilled serial killer, Gannon and Duarte uncovered suspicious drownings, signs of foul play, and a common thread linking the crimes. Their investigation took an increasingly sensational turn when two individuals published a report in 2008, which gained widespread attention. The report suggested that these 14 cases could be attributed to a well-organized network of serial killers with chapters in various American cities. Their victims were often college students who frequented bars and enjoyed successful lives, making the motives appear baffling. Gannon explained that the killers were a structured gang that drugged, abducted, held, and eventually murdered their victims before disposing of them in bodies of water. The distinctive smiley face graffiti near the dump sites served as their macabre trademark, possibly confirming kills and communicating with fellow members. The gang purportedly operated through the dark web, utilizing encrypted communication to organize the murders, even coordinating multiple incidents on the same night, hundreds of miles apart. Despite their efforts, Gannon and Duarte have yet to apprehend the gang or bring them to justice. The investigation has spanned over two decades, leaving the sadistic killers at large, potentially expanding their influence. Skepticism remains, but even a criminal justice professor, Lee Gilbertson, eventually became convinced after meeting with the detectives in person. Gilbertson now supports their theory, alongside Gannon, Duarte, and another detective named Mike Donovan, forming the core of the Vincilla Vigilante Investigation Squad. The fact that the Smile Face Killer investigation remains unresolved raises concerns about the gang's continued activities and their ability to evade capture. It leaves one questioning why the FBI or other agencies haven't stepped in, given the substantial evidence at hand. In their relentless pursuit of justice, a team consisting of a criminal law professor and three retired detectives focused on murders orchestrated by dark web criminal gangs. Despite the FBI's apparent lack of attention, the team was determined to uncover the truth. Their efforts were supported by a dedicated group of online amateur investigators who identified numerous cases fitting the smiley face killer's pattern. Through a television series, the team shed light on additional alleged crimes, including the suspicious death of Dakota James. Suspicion grew as Dakota's unusual encounter and autopsy evidence suggested foul play. As the investigation deepened, connections to an international network of killers emerged. While progress has been made, a comprehensive investigation and protection of potential victims remain vital. The smiley face murder theory, while important to the grieving families involved, lacks substantial evidence to support its claims. The FBI has already addressed the theory and stated that the majority of these instances appear to be alcohol-related drownings. The theory's proponents may be connecting unrelated cases and misinterpreting common graffiti symbols as significant clues. Seeing patterns where none exist is a common human tendency known as apophenia. The theory's focus on college students and the effects of drugs and alcohol in relation to drowning accidents may offer a more plausible explanation. While some cases remain suspicious, sensationalizing the theory does not detract from the tragic reality of these deaths.